Honorable Minister of Rural and Development, Rural Development and Land Reform. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Honorable Deputy Speaker, seated there in the gallery, are guests of the President of the Republic of South Africa. They are here from all corners of the country, not to listen to this debate, but they've got their own process down in, the, in, the, in this ICC. They are there involved in a, in a, in a tour uh, of the country, pre-colonial, colonial, colonial uh, post-union, apartheid South Africa, and through to the current democracy. We invite the honorable members to join them this evening and tomorrow and go there. The president opened it today. You will be amazed. It's awesome. Thank you, honorable deputy speaker, on that. There are three of our colleagues here from provinces, Gauteng, Eastern Cape, and Northwest are sitting here. They are all guests of the, of the president. Marian Lacey opens the introduction to her book, Working for Barocco, the Origins of a, of a Coercive Labor System in South Africa, with the following quote from a letter by one Philippus Bopape addressed to the sub-native commissioner at Petersburg, dated 23 November 1917. Very briefly, he says, there is another awful branch of this bad law, that a native is not allowed to hire a white's farm by money, except by working for nothing, Barocco. Lacey goes further to say, there, there were four major issues facing successive governments in the first two decades after Union in 1910, namely, how to inhibit further the growth of an independent African peasantry so as to force all Africans to become migrant workers dependent on the wage, on the wage sector for their survival. Secondly, linked to the first one, was where to settle African sharecroppers my great-grandfather and my grandfather was a sharecropper, were, they, were sharecroppers, by the way. Half share farmers and cash tenants said to have been squatting illegally on white-owned farms. Thirdly, the third issue was the mass influx of Africans to the towns, which created a new and urgent problem for the state, one which reached crisis point in the early 20s. Lastly, linked to the third problem, was a buildup of untrained, unskilled whites as more and more of them streamed into the towns. Like African peasants, small farmers and beef owners had, had, had been squeezed off the land with the spread of capitalist farming. The first three, Honorable Deputy Speaker, these are the first three problems remain with the democratic ANC government, which took control of state power in 1994 almost a decade since the establishment of Union in 1910. Sambitere Blanche in his book, A History of Inequality in South Africa, 1652 to 2002, makes the following observations about the act. He says, by depriving African farmers of much of their land and ending sharecropping and tenant farming on white-owned land, an agricultural and entrepreneurial tradition and store of indigenous farming knowledge were destroyed. It is difficult to determine the value of this tradition, but it was probably considerable because it was well adopted, adapted to South Africa's weather, land, and labor peculiarities. If this African agricultural tradition had not been destroyed, but given more or less the same government support, both financial and technologically, given to white farmers, South Africa's agricultural and economic history could have been radically different." End quote. But Ter Blanche makes a more telling observation on the legacy of the Land Act on African life. He says, the combined effect of the Land Act and deteriorating socioeconomic conditions in the bundle stands on the one hand, and strictly enforced influx control measures on the other, created a situation of systemic violence that deliberately or inadvertently criminalized many migrant workers. 
The inevitable result of this inhumane situation was that millions of Africans were drawn into a vicious cycle of violence, lawlessness, and criminality. It is ironic that the strong inclination towards criminality was not restricted to migrants. Many African youths with residential rights in urban areas were also criminalized. In their case, this was not the result of influx control, but, a, a discriminatory, but as a result of discriminatory measures. As the educational levels of, Afri of, of urban African youth rose, and their job advancement opportunities were blocked, many opted to make a living from crime. Honorable Deputy, Deputy Speaker, what is the ANC government doing to reverse the legacy of the Natives Land Act today? Because that is history. Rural development and land reform is the key program or instrument of the ANC government to deal with this, with this legacy. Two programs, rural development, the second one is land reform. Rural development has three phases, meeting basic human needs. The reconstruction and development program is a very clear program which we're following looking at meeting basic human needs of the people of South Africa, particularly the historically discriminated people of South Africa. Secondly, rural enterprise development. Honorable Deputy Speaker, we have already, we have in South Africa, whether we like it or not, we've got many farms, 1,296 that have been recapitalized. Those are enterprises. They're making lots of money. I was standing here in the, at this podium and said, Mukachane family in the free state, they, say, they send me an SMS message to say, because of this program, because of this program, we are going to open our own butchery in Virginia very soon this year. I hope that some of members here will go there. Those are enterprises as a result of this government. Rural industries sustained by rural markets. Honorable Deputy Speaker, recently, a couple of months ago, we visited Ngoha with the president, where we, we harvested more than 700 hectares of land. That was maize. Now, we were asking the, the, the farmers there, where are you going to sell this maize? They said, no, it's already been sold. Reason? Because we have a partnership with Amatlelo Agri. And there's a dairy parlor there, 50-50%. That strategic partnership, they, they've already, they bought the land, the maize there. It's, it's, it's happening. It's happening in our country today. That's what we are doing, Honorable. Land reform, there's four pillars, four pillars. The Honorable Members of the House have to note this, restitution. Restitution is restitution. It is restoring that which was taken away from people. Whether or not that land is developed is another matter. The key point here is that restore the land to those from whom it was taken by force. Period. Period. Then you talk about, let's, let's debate the rest. Let's debate the rest. The second one is redistribution. Redistribution has to do with rekindling the class of black commercial farmers which was destroyed by the 1913 Natives Land Act. That's what we're doing. When I talk about 1,296 farmers, I'm talking about us rekindling this class of black commercial farmers in South Africa. We're on course, we're doing it. It's not a story. Let me just come back a little bit to, 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 to land tenure reform. Land tenure reform, this country has not actually done this. You see, tenure reform has got to do with economic power. It's not just a story, it's economic power. Because ultimately it translates into political power. And we need that power, we need that economic power. We've got political power in the country, but as long as we don't tamper with the land tenure system in this country, this is the matter which we are, we, we, we are, we are handling right now as we speak. Honorable Speaker, both in terms of state and public land, privately owned land. Thirdly, in terms of land owned by foreigners in our country. And fourthly, the communal land tenure model. The communal tenure model is the most sensitive one because we're talking about the 13%. That's, what the, that's the land that the Honorable Tebekul was referring to here. Last week on Friday, I was in Guazulu Natal. We, we are actually consulting on this particular one. We, I went to uh, Mambondo in the West 
two Fridays ago, last Friday I was in KwaZulu Natal. We're going to the, all the provinces, consulting on this one, because we want to transform the economy in those areas so that the people in those areas can benefit from the wealth that is under the soil they're living on and they own. So fourthly, Honorable Deputy Speaker, is development. Institutional support. We were here uh, during the, the, the budget and policy speech, we were here and saying, by the way, that we will come back to the House and present to the House policies. We'll present policies once Cabinet sorted them out, the Land Management Commission. Because in South Africa, we must also remember this, that in South Africa we had four provinces, and then we added nine Bandustans. Each one of them had a register on land ownership. But when came democracy in 1994, they came together. But mainly, the four provinces which constituted union before, they dominated. So now what you have is also the ideology that was underpinning that, was that provinces basically, they continued to be, to be almost independent rather than autonomous of Pretoria. And there's a disjuncture between what you'll find in Pretoria and what you find in provinces. The result is that what you get in the provinces, you think is right, it's not right. The Land Management Commission is going to be a one-stop shop where all land-related matters are dealt with. The Office of the Value General, that one is going to be, uh, is going to be established very soon. The, the bill is out on public uh, participation right as we speak, uh, together with the amendment to the Restitution Act that exists now. Because we are going to reopen, the President was here, he made this announcement. We are going to reopen the land claims, and South Africans are going to have an opportunity once more to lodge claims. And in terms of the proposal in the bill, it's going to be five years until 2018. Now, it, and we have developed a manual, Honorable Deputy Speaker. It's going to be distributed to all South Africans in all languages, all 11 languages, including the Khoi and the San languages, so that all of them understand what is it that is expected of them? Already there are people out there who are calling meetings and organizing and charging monies, 50 rands, we know we've had another group here in Google, 85 rands. Honorable members, we must arrest those people because those people are criminals. There is going to be no money paid by people who are lodging claims. It is going to be free. It's a service that the government of the African National Congress is providing to the people of South Africa. The Land Rights Management Board is another institution. This institution is part of dealing with the security of tenure of farm workers. Honorable Deputy Speaker, during the recess, we are going to meet with organized labor to discuss with them the proposals we've got on the table with regards to dealing with evictions, dealing with the security of tenure of farm workers and dwellers in this country, so that we do away completely with the eviction of people in South Africa. Honorable Deputy Speaker, as I conclude, let me just, in conclusion, uh, go, go back to one small onion, I think, with the, 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 with the Honorable Matole said. You see, the, the campaign, the campaign, this is what Sol Plagi says. It's very interesting. I'm closing now. Sol Plagi says, the campaign to, com to compass the elimination of the, of the blacks from the farms was not at all popular with landowners who made huge profits out of the renting of their farms to natives. Ironic, isn't it? Platform speakers and newspaper writers coined a, 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 an opprobrious phrase with which designated this letting of farms to natives as care for farming and attempted to prove that it was almost as immoral as baby farming. But landowners pocketed the annual rents and showed no inclination to substitute the less industrious poor whites for the more industrious natives. They were, st they were better. That's what Bandi would say. They were better. African farmers were better than the lazy white farmers of the time. Old bus, a typical Dutch landowner of the Free State, having collected his share of the crop of, 19, of 1912, addressing a few words of encouragement to his native tenants on the subject of expelling the blacks from the farms, 
said in, in the Tal, quote, how dare any number of men wearing tall hats and frock coats living in Cape Town hotels at the expense of other men order me to evict my natives. This is my ground. It costs my money, not parliaments. And I will see them banged before I do it." Unquote. This, is a, this is a farmer, this is a white farmer who is making a living out of renting out their land to natives. It then became evident that the authority of parliament would have to be sought to compel the obstinate landowners to get rid of their natives. And the compliance, the compliance of parliament with this demand was the greatest ministerial surrender to the Republican malcontents, resulting in the introduction and passage of the Natives, Natives Land Act of 1913. Inasmuch as the act decreed in the name of His Majesty the King <laughs> that pending the adoption of a report to be made by a commission, somewhere in the dim and unknown future, it shall be unlawful for natives to buy or lease land, except in scheduled native areas. And under severe pains and penalties, they were to be deprived of the bare human rights of living on the land, except the servants in the employ of whites, rights which were never seriously challenged under the Republican regime, no matter how politicians raved against the natives. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. That's about the past of South Africa and the present today in terms of our government of the African National Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister.